Good evening and welcome again to Ideas at Work and Beyond. We have a very exciting show. One of our special guests is going to be joining us. But I just wanted to start the show with a little bit of an epiphany that I had. Um, I'm fascinated by uh, what's going on in the war in Iraq. Um, I was uh, fascinated by the life story of Pat Tillman. Now, many of you will remember that Pat Tillman played Division I college football at Arizona State University, and he went on to have an incredible career with the Arizona Cardinals. I think we can hold this up. You'll, you'll remember him. He's a very handsome young guy. Yeah, that's Pat Tillman. They like that picture. He was a bit of a, a wild guy. He used to climb up on the stanchions at uh, Arizona State University Stadium just to be up above it all, and he would hang out there. He was quite, had quite an adventurous soul. And after 9-11, Pat Tillman and his brother decided that what they were going to do, where they were going to volunteer in the United States Army. And they wanted to have the toughest uh, Army experience that they could have, so they went to Ranger School. Now here's a guy who was making over a couple million dollars a year playing in the NFL, but he decided that he was going to give all that up and he was going to defend our freedoms by putting on uh, uh, the uniform of a United States Army Ranger and went over to Afghanistan. As you read this book, it was by uh, John Krakauer, who also wrote uh, Into Thin Air and, uh, and some other uh, pretty interesting books. But he wrote this book called Where Men Win Glory, and it talks about Pat Tillman and his life and the ultimate sacrifice that he paid as he was, uh, as a result of uh, combat, died in, uh, in service to his country. As it tragically turned out, it turned out that it was a friendly fire incident. And I looked into that too, and fully 31% of the casualties um, that we're experiencing both uh, in, uh, primarily in Afghanistan are as, as a result of friendly fire. So it's one of the tragedies of war. So that, that book and the story of Pat Tillman touched my heart and then the, then the next book I read was a book called The Lone Survivor. Um, this was uh, uh, talking about the Navy SEALs. And there was a group of four Navy SEALs that, um, uh, that were out and they were doing uh, reconnaissance. And they came upon some shepherds up in the mountains in Afghanistan. They decided to let them go. That brought an, an entire uh, platoon of uh, Taliban down. Of the four... Only one of the SEALs ended up surviving, and, uh, and his name was uh, Marcus Luttrell. Uh, one of the SEALs um, uh, earned the Congressional Medal of Honor in the battle that ensued with the Taliban. And it was just a pretty incredible story about uh, the Navy SEALs and how they uh, supported each other. Again, tragically in this story, uh, there was a group of Navy SEALs when they heard that their comrades were in trouble. There about 10 of them all got on a Chinook helicopter, went up there, and um, uh, tragically, they, 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 uh, the Chinook helicopter took a direct hit from a, a rocket-propelled grenade, and uh, a, a total of, I think, 10 Navy SEALs, the, the worst loss of life in any action the Navy SEALs lost then. And then the most recent book I'm reading is a book by Sebastian Younger. He also wrote the book um, that talked about, uh, or The Perfect Storm, many of you will remember that. And he talks about a group of army soldiers that are fighting. The epiphany took place when I started looking at the maps in these various books. It's maps along that border with Pakistan in, in, in the contested tribal region between Pakistan and Afghanistan. And I'm thinking about all the good men that are going to these areas and are fighting our battles to defend our freedom for our country. And then later I heard that in Afghanistan, they've just come upon some mineral deposits where if that country could just get its act together and start uh, mining and developing some of their natural resources, they would have revenue and resources for their countries for decades and decades to come to develop their country. And I look at Iraq sitting on a, a, an absolute ton of oil. I look at Afghanistan and the natural resources they now have with, I think it's lithium or, or something that you need for batteries. I mean, just over a trillion dollars worth of natural resources. And I say, you know, America was attacked in 2001. And we went over there and we took the battle to our enemies and those that would harbor enemies and those that would be willing to support nation states that would be willing to support terrorist organizations. But at this point, I feel like at some level we've made our point. 
and that Iraqis need to run their country. We've given them a democracy. In Afghanistan, they have a democracy, as, as fractured as it might be, but they need to begin to run their own country. I think it's time that uh, the brave men and women of the United States that have surged so heroically, including the ones represented in this book, I think it's time for the policymakers in Afghanistan to begin to take responsibility for their own country. Heaven knows we've got enough to work on in America um, to begin to focus on that. So it was an epiphany in the sense that all of these, Pat Tillman, Marcus Terrell, and then this group of uh, army soldiers that Sebastian Youngers talks about in his newly released book, War, were all fighting over the same area in Afghanistan. It's time for the Afghan people to take responsibility for their own democracy, and heaven knows we got enough to do uh, over here um, just to support our country. So, I just wanted to get that off my chest. Um, I am delighted to welcome back to the program Sam Caligari. Marty. Thank you very much. Thank you for you know sitting through my uh, little uh, um, you know outburst at no, the beginning. Not at all. I really it's feel pleasure. like everyone should have a TV show so they have a chance to just kind of get stuff off their mind or or when they begin to see these uh, you know different patterns that begin to form and say you know wait a minute you know I, we made our point you know they took down two of our buildings we in essence took down two of their governments. And now it's up to the Afghan people and the Iraqi people to establish their own democracy. You know, we can't, we can't hold their hand forever. And, uh, and it's up to them to rise and fall on their own. But anyways, first of all, congratulations on Thank your you. win at the Republican convention. Thank you very much. You Thank are the you. newly minted Republican nominee for the 5th Congressional District. That's and right. And you're running against Chris Murphy. That's right. That's right. exactly right. Now, um, we were just talking a little bit before the program. Um, I, I guess, first of all, and I'll stop talking, but first of all... <laughs> it's your show. I know. You I, can do anything you I want. Know, I, I got it. My mother told me you have two ears and one mouth, but I tend to, <laughs> I tend to ramble. First of all, you have a, um, a primary, uh, and there are two what I would consider lesser candidates, uh, Justin Breen, Bernier? That's right. Bernier? Yeah. And, uh, and Mark Greenberg. Um, although you think possibly Mark Greenberg uh, doesn't have the signatures? Well, we don't, we don't know yet. Um, okay. uh, Mark, uh, there are two ways you can qualify for a primary, either by getting 15% of the delegates at the convention, with, which Justin did, right. um, or by going out there and collecting signatures, which Mark has attempted to do, but the Secretary of State has to certify yeah. that he got the required number of signatures and that they were all valid. Okay. And so we're waiting to see what happens there. But it looks like we're likely to have a primary. Could be a two-person primary. Could be a three-person primary. Now let me ask you this, because Dan DeBasol was in that seat, yeah, and he agreed to do a call-in uh, video debate. Would you be willing to do that during oh, the primary yeah, season? Yeah, it'd be a pleasure. You sure? Yeah. I'm not putting you on the spot because no. we're on TV. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. I Just because we're sitting here on my <laughs> television and you ask me, and people are all wondering what I'm going to say. No, I don't feel like I'm on the spot at all, Marty. My bad, my bad. <laughs> no, actually, no. I uh, look. I'd we look, got a Thursday to fill every yeah. Thursday, and if no. we get a couple candidates in here. You know, a good mud rustling session. We're you know, and I, I actually, I think the more the better, yeah. uh, because I think a couple things happen. The public benefits mm -hmm. when they get to hear people talk about the issues and talk about their ideas. That's number one. Absolutely. That's it's the critical part to our democratic process. The second thing is, as candidates, I think we all improve. The mm -hmm. more we can talk, the more we're, we hear what other people have to say, mm -hmm. the sharper our message becomes. Yeah. And ultimately, at the end of the day. The goal is to put a new congressman in the 5th District. Mm -hmm. Because with all due respect to Congressman Murphy, he is grossly out of step with this district. Yeah. Now, do you, do you consider that uh, you're beginning to run now against Chris Murphy? Or do you consider like you're focusing more on these primaries? What's, what's sort of your My strategy? focus is on Chris Murphy. Are you there? Uh, my focus is on Chris Murphy and on talking about how I believe there is a better way to make life better for people in Connecticut mm -hmm. and the 5th District than what Chris Murphy and Nancy Pelosi have been advancing. Mm -hmm. uh, if these other guys want to come uh, you know, uh, after me, you know, that's part of the Democratic process. But okay. my focus is on Chris Murphy. I'm the Republican nominee. Uh, if we have a primary... You know, I'm going to stay focused on the issues that matter to people. And that's mm -hmm. not an intra-party fight. That's how are we going to work to make life better for people and how and why can we do a better job than Chris Murphy. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm going to be focused on, Marty. This is what, I mean, and I'd be very interested in here as you, as you go around the district, what's the feedback you're getting. But what I hear is Chris Murphy is vulnerable. 
more vulnerable than Jim Himes in the 4th District. What are you sensing? I mean, he seems like a very likable person. Oh, uh, Chris and kid I, next door, Eagle Scout, yeah, you know. Yeah, no, first of all, Chris and I are friends. I succeeded him in the state Senate. Mm-hmm. Uh, this isn't personal. He's a smart, capable guy. Mm-hmm. But his ideas, I believe, are wrong. They're wrong for this country. They're wrong for this state. They're wrong for this district. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris Murphy was in the right place at the right time in 2006. Mm -hmm. Um, In 2008, he hadn't built enough of record to really run against, and he benefited from the Obama tidal wave. Yeah, no doubt. In 2010, Chris Murphy is going to have to do something he's never had to do before, Mm -hmm. which is be on a level playing field where he can't hide behind George Bush. He can't hide behind Republican majorities in Congress. He's got to answer for his record. Mm -hmm. And I'm really excited about having a very respectful but firm and vigorous debate about the issues, mm-hmm. about the way I think you can do health care reform very differently and better than what Chris Murphy has advocated, mm-hmm. uh, the better way to grow the economy than what Chris Murphy and Nancy Pelosi have advocated. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm looking forward to talking about during this campaign. Call you there. Um, okay, th- th- let's take health care, for example. Yeah. Um, Chris Murphy voted in favor of it. He voted, he voted right down the line with Nancy Pelosi. Um, it would seem, and, and you tell me, because you're, you're in the 5th District more and you, you get the pulse of the people, but is that there was a, a white-hot intensity against this health care reform when they were passing it? Do you think that that's dissipated some and it's not as front-burner issue? Or can you, no. like, uh, like Scott Brown ran, I will be the 41st vote against health care, and he won overwhelmingly in, in historically very liberal districts? Well, I think the issue is still very alive. It's still very real. Uh, because the changes that Chris Murphy advocated are not the right changes for this district. Uh I mean, and Chris Murphy, as much as people were upset with the public option, instead of moving towards the middle, Chris Murphy was actually doubling down and moving even further to the left in order and and just when so many members of the Democratic Party were saying, "Hey, maybe we should move away from the public option." Mm-hmm. Chris Murphy goes to New Haven, gives a speech and says, "We need to fight harder than ever for the public option." The public option wasn't even approved yeah. by the Democrats in Congress, and yet Chris Murphy was vocally pushing for it. That was the ultimate example of government takeover of health care. Yeah. So, it's still a relevant issue, and here's why. Improving our health care system is something we have to continue to fight for and do. But there's a better way to do it than what Chris Murphy and Nancy Pelosi have been advocating. And it's not too late to scale back and repeal the things that he's advocated and supported that I think are going to make things worse for people. Mm-hmm. So that's why, you know, we, we still have time. I mean, this program is going to take several years to unfold. We have funding issues. We can repeal the takeover. We can defund things to the extent that it's necessary. Mm-hmm. And here's the thing. We need to do health care reform. I want to talk about how we can do health care reform. Mm-hmm. But we need to do it in a way that doesn't raise taxes, doesn't cut Medicare, doesn't increase the deficit, and doesn't ultimately result in a federal takeover over of our health care system, all of which would be a disaster for people, Marty. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, I mean, I think even, even right now, I, I think we have a call coming in, but even right now, people are beginning to see the first understanding what Obamacare really means. Let me try it. Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? You know, put them on my cell phone. It's 438-2003. Come right through on the cell phone. It'll be easier. 438-2003, because the, uh, people have been trying to call in, but they can't get through. But Obamacare, even right now, they're, they're the Congressional Oversight Committee or, or whomever is coming out with, what does this really mean? And all this nonsense, I say, like, well, if you like your, like your health care, you can keep it. Um, if uh, if um, the, the costs aren't going to be too high, you know, all, the, all these different things just aren't coming to pass. And I think the more we find out, I mean, I love Pelosi. She, she, House Speaker Pelosi. I mean her no disrespect. Of course. But she said, we need to pass this bill so we can find out what's in it. I know. Well, guess what? They passed the bill, and we're finding out what's in it, and it's not terribly impressive. It turns out it's going to cost us a heck of a lot of money. Um, call, are you there? Call... Jeez. Oh, All right. Sorry about this. Keep trying to call back. We'll get you. Um, so you see, you think that that health care issue is still, it's still resonating? It's, in the it's district. still resonating. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, it's still resonating because people are very concerned with the fact that it's going to grow the size of our government, mm-hmm. results in cuts to Medicare, increased taxes, and is the first step towards government takeover of health care. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that's what people in the 5th District want. 
Yeah. Hey, we want health care reform. We need to do health care reform. But mm-hmm. that's not the way to do it, Marty. Mm-hmm. So it's going to continue to be an issue. And, and look, what excites me about this race, Marty, mm-hmm. is that I think we're able to have a very high-level discussion about issues. Mm-hmm. Because elections aren't about the candidates. They aren't about Chris Murphy or Sam Gallagher. Mm-hmm. They're about the people. Mm-hmm. And they're about our competing visions for how we can make life better for the people. That's the only thing that matters. And I'm really excited to have that debate with Chris Murphy. I've challenged him to a debate three months ago on health care. What's I'm, the story there? Well, you know what? I think he's going to bob and weave and duck as long as he can. He doesn't want to be engaged on what this issue. What about right here? Let's I'll get do him it. Good. <laughs> if he's watching right. now, let's get him on. For those of you, uh, for our vast viewing audience, some of you who are trying to call in right now, but uh, we can't quite get the can and the string to work together on the phone system. By the way, you can call my cell phone, 438-2003, and we'll put you right on the air that way. But uh, if you know Chris Murphy, if you're a relative of his, or if you know a cousin of his, let him know that we have a show right here on live television every Thursday night, Ideas of Work and Beyond. Tony Boucher has, uh, had, had, has had a live debate. Dan DiBasella is man enough to uh, come in and debate candidates here. And we would love to have Chris Murphy come in. You can have the, um, you know, a, a referee of your choice. You can have a panel of people that you pick to ask the questions. And we would love to have you come in and debate the issues because, frankly, I think the people have a right to know. And you can go out and you can shake hands and you can meet people in the public square and you can go to all the rot- Rotary Club dinners you want. But you have an opportunity on Comcast Studios, on this television program, to really meet people. They're switching around the dial. And all of a sudden, they see the candidates maybe for the first time, and they have a chance to call in and ask questions and get answers to some of these issues. Because frankly, I think the population has never been more engaged than they are right now. I mean, we're sitting at home, we're we're watching, uh, uh, you know, this oil spill unfold, and and frankly, it's it's got people uh, concerned. Uh, yeah, caller, you're on the air. Yes, good evening. Um, I have a question for the candidate. Um, I know uh, Chris Murphy has a lot of respect uh, among the veterans and the veteran organization. Um, have you been uh, meeting with any veterans or veterans organizations? And do uh, you have any uh, military experience? I'll hang up and listen. Thank you. Sure. That's an excellent question. Excellent yeah, question. What it about is. that? It is. Well, I, I've been very active as a state senator with the VFWs and the American Legion in my state senate district. So I've been very involved uh, with veterans groups. I have spoken with them many times. I have worked with them on their issues as many uh-huh. as much as I can and every time that I've been asked to do. And in terms of my middle military experience, something a lot of people don't realize is serving in the military was really my first great love in life. Okay. Um, I was an aspiring Army officer, um, but a knee injury ended up forcing me out of what was then Army ROTC. Uh, I even then went to the Marine Corps. They accepted me into the Platoon Leaders Course Program. Uh I was on the road to becoming a Marine Corps officer. I went to Quantico, Virginia. And on the second day of in and on the second day of in processing, yeah, the, the doctors there um, sent me back home uh, on an NPQ, which stands for Non Physically Qualified, because of my knee injury. Huh. So I fought for three years to actually try to become uh, an officer, first in the Army and then in the in the Marine Corps. That was my first great calling. Wow. Um, and one of the reasons I turned to government is because I realized over time that that was another way that I can serve our country and our community, which was my motivation behind wanting to serve Mm -hmm. in the military in the first place. Excellent. All right, caller, you're on the air. Hi, Sam. Um, The other day, the New Times ran a front-page article about the stimulus and funding for our Head Start program. I just wanted to ask, would you have been in support of this bill, the stimulus package? The, uh, The second stimulus, caller? The, the, the second, are we talking about the second stimulus bill that they're trying to push through right now? Or the first stimulus? The, the first one. Uh, I would have voted against the first stimulus bill. Uh, because ultimately they pitched the stimulus bill as a way of growing the economy. Mm-hmm. And virtually nothing in that stimulus bill was relevant to growing our economy, caller. Um, if we needed to put out an aid program in terms of expanding uh, unemployment benefits and other ways of helping people and giving them a bridge during this difficult time, let's call it what it is. Let's not call it economic stimulus. I think what bothered me about the stimulus bill, the way it came down, was that it was an opportunity in the name of growing our economy to throw everything, including the kitchen sink, into a bill Mm -hmm. where the vast majority of what was in there was not going to help grow our economy. 
And yet that's how it was sold to the American people. Mm -hmm. And so if we had broken that bill up into parts and taken pure stimulus and what could have grown the economy and segmented that off and separate from Mm -hmm. those parts of what became the stimulus bill that intended to provide a bridge for people, that's something that I could have supported in different forms. Mm -hmm. But the way they lumped everything in together and tried to sell it as economic stimulus, I would have voted against it because it's done virtually nothing to grow our economy. If anything, the unemployment rate has gone up and it's it's stayed up there, except for census workers. And and here's the thing, Marty, and just to follow up with your caller, one of the things that frustrates me about government and it frustrates people about government is when politicians try to sell one thing to people, yeah. when in reality the bill does something very different. Mm. And so I think we've got to be straight with the American people, and very little of what was in that bill had anything to do with growing the economy. Yeah. And that was my basic objection with the bill. And my objection, because I smell a rat, I, I guess I'm, I'm cynical to begin with, but like money that they say, oh, we're going to pump up money that's going to go to Chrysler. Where that money went, it was it went into the UAW's coffers for you know back pay for whatever negotiations that they negotiated that is in, eventually put the company into bankruptcy to begin with. So I really smell a rat when I see a lot of money going to political supporters of the Obama administration. You don't have to agree with me. This is on me, uh, but but that's what I see is our tax dollars is, are going to support these these. Folks, said, look, everyone has a right to be in a union, but don't ask me to spend my tax dollars to underwrite you because you're giving political support to one party. And then it bugs me, I know this is getting off topic here, but also when they're taking our tax dollars to support the Palestinians against the nation of Israel. I've got a real problem with that, too. Yeah. You know, Caller, are you there? Caller, are you there? Hello? Yeah, this is your big TV chance. By the way... Lose my cell phone number after you call, okay? We're not going to be best buddies. I think Go it's ahead. up on the screen, Marty. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding you. You can call anytime. I lead a sheltered life. You're on the air. We have the uh, next congressman from the 5th Congressional District right here. Did you have a question? Well, yes, I did. Well, with the comment, I want uh, his opinion. Yes, ma'am. Uh, when the man in the White House said that illegal aliens will not be covered in the health care. He wasn't lying. He just did not mention that once they get amnesty, they will be covered. And that is their plan. Now, it also applies. He's also not lying when he says that everybody's going to be allowed to keep whatever insurance they have now if they like it better. Yeah, and right. Step over too because the corporations and companies are going to dump the retired people that they're covering and say, "Get out and go get in the socialized medicine uh, camp." And they know that also. Am I wrong? Thank you for the call. I think I I, I'll, I want to have the con- congressman will answer, but I think you're absolutely right. This is the this is the biggest bait and switch we've ever seen in this this uh, uh, bill of goods they sold us with the health care. It's just a disaster. But thank you for the call. Go ahead, Sam. You know, um, caller, thank you very much for that question. And and the fact is, I'm not a cynical person by nature. But I think they set up this health care bill, and your second example is a perfect illustration Mm -hmm. of the way I think it's going to play out and how intentional I think it was. Mm -hmm. I mean, after this bill was passed, you saw a number of companies do the math Mm -hmm. and realize that it would cost them less to pay the penalty for not offering health insurance Mm -hmm. than it would to provide it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that there are some people who advocated this bill who want companies to drop their employees Mm -hmm. so that the Democrat majorities and the liberals in particular, because not all Democrats are liberals, but Mm -hmm. the liberals in particular are going to go and say, well, voila, see, big bad business doesn't want to provide health insurance to their employees. Mm -hmm. We, the government, have to. Mm -hmm. And I believe they're setting up a system that's going to get them to where they want it to be in the first place, which is in a situation where the government ultimately provides a single-payer type health system Mm -hmm. for the entire American public. And I think that's partially by design. Mm -hmm. And you're seeing with the economics and the basic math calculations that these companies are doing, Mm -hmm. 
that that's exactly the outcome that may occur. I think that's disingenuous. I think it's wrong. I think it's cynical, and I think it's ultimately going to hurt the American public mm -hmm. on many, many levels. That's one of the reasons why I signed a pledge saying that I would pe repeal the federal takeover of this health care system mm -hmm. and fight for real reforms that you can make without ever growing the size of the federal government. Mm -hmm. Our federal government has grown to a point where we can't sustain what we have already. I Why saw, are we I continuing graph, to grow it? I saw a graph, and, and you can expand on this. It had a bar graph of our gross national product. What is it, $13 trillion? And then it has a bar graph right next to it of our accumulated national debt. And that was something like $13 trillion. Yeah. And you don't got to be a genius to go, this, this, can't, this can't go on. This can't be sustained. Um, call, call, caller, you're on the air. Caller, you're on the air. Unless this is my wife wanting me to bring home a quart of milk. Your wife has a very husky voice. She does. <laughs> <laughs> Caller, you're on the air. If you called in the TV show, now is your time to speak. Okay, this is Professor Sam. Um, I was wondering, uh, would you consider yourself the uh, Tea Party candidate for this campaign, or do you want to be? Good question. Very good question. Do you run from the Tea Party? No, absolutely not. Do you That's embrace it. the Tea Party? Absolutely. Sarah Palin's in town right now. Would you want to appear on the show with Sarah <laughs> Palin and uh, you know have a picture with her arm in arm? You yes know, or no? I'm so glad you don't put your guess on the spot. You <laughs> right. know, I love that about you, People Marty. People want to know. <laughs> Actually, know? the answer is yes, absolutely. I'd be okay. delighted to. Right. I mean, she's, she is a strong leader. Agree mm -hmm. or disagree with Sarah Palin? Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. Here's as someone who's bucked the establishment, mm -hmm. as someone who has had to speak truth to power, one of the things that respect, I respect so much about Sarah Palin oh, is oh, what she oh, did oh, to take on the political establishment in Alaska, even when it meant on taking leaders and powerful leaders in her own party. So I, I respect that tremendously about her. But to the caller's question, I, I'd be delighted to have Tea Party support. I have a lot of folks who are in the Tea Party today um, who are part of that movement who support my candidacy. Mm -hmm. and, and one of the reasons why I've been supportive of the movement is because the Tea Party is really a group of average, everyday Americans mm -hmm. who are usually too busy to be politically active, mm -hmm. who have become so concerned with the direction that our country is heading in that they've committed themselves to political activism. Yeah. And frankly, it's not a Republican activism well, or a Democratic they activism. Got, they got they no are time for every bit, Republicans. They are every bit as upset with Republicans who have sold out yeah. as they are with Democrats who have sold out. Yeah. So I support the American people. I understand their frustration. Mm -hmm. I understand their anger, and I want to go to Washington at this moment in time in our history as mm -hmm. a state and as a nation, because if we don't correct the mm -hmm. course that we're on, I don't believe that our country will be what it has been and what has made it great. And I really fear that we're on the verge and we've started going down the road of advancing policies yeah. that are going to destroy this country as we know it. So I'm Hold very on. supportive of, of what folks are concerned with and want to change. Mm -hmm. And so I'd be delighted to have support from folks in that movement. All right. Caller, you're on the air. Yes, how are you doing? Good. Um, I just want to... Hello. you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Go right ahead. Yes. I, I think you Republicans are the biggest hypocrites there is. There are. Why were all the Republicans talking about conservative government and everything when Bush was outspending everything, you know, you know, this war and everything? And... For your information, you guys should get your fact right. A lot of the problems that we have in this country was from when Ronald Reagan was in, was it, was in office. The great Ronald Reagan, deregulation, um, air, air traffic controllers, spending this, this Star Wars system on space. I mean, all of a sudden you get a black man in office, and all of a sudden all these white people, all, especially Republicans, they want to get into this conservative government. You guys should really look at your record, your spending record, um, and really see what your party's all about. So, um, if, if you want to talk about terrorism and, and war, you know why? You know, 19 out of the 22 terrorism that attacked 9-11 was from Saudi Arabia. But you know why we don't attack Saudi Arabia, if you listen to your facts. The Saudi Arabian government owns more in this country than any other foreign government in this country. So that's why we don't go after Saudi Arabia. So, you know, um, 
from the Reagan years to the Bush's years, from um, Saddam Hussein, we were all in cahoots with them. So, you know, let's be, let, let's be real. You know, let's be honest. All right, can you, can you hold the line? Yes. Okay, what's your, what's your first name? <laughs> so don't lie to me. Well, uh, what, what, say again? All right, I'll just call you the caller. Okay, the caller. You brought up some things. I took some notes. Air traffic controller, uh, basically that was a federal, um, it was a federal job, and they, they signed an oath that they wouldn't strike against, uh, against the country. Sort of like uh, mail carriers, uh, uh, policemen, things like that. They sign an oath. Air traffic controllers are considered a vital job, and, and Reagan sort of took them to task for that. As far as Star Wars is concerned, just, just follow me, because I, I think you, you hit it out of the park on a couple of these. As far as Star Wars is concerned, I think that might have been Reagan's finest hour. I mean, if you ever watch poker on TV, it was Texas Hold'em, and Reagan went all in and, and bankrupt the other guy because they couldn't keep up with, with our uh, technology as far as Star Wars. And I think it brought to a close the Cold War, so we might disagree with that. As far as spending... You hit that one out of the park, and I think that's what Sam was saying, that, uh, that the Republicans that overspend and drive our, our future generations into debt are no better than Democrats, so I think you're completely right. As far as being soft on the terrorists, the 19 of the 20 coming from Saudi Arabia, and most of them, by the way, end up with silver spoons in their mouth, and it's interesting to see all the subsequent Yahoo terrorists that come over here, like the guy blowing up his underwear in Detroit. This kid was a kid of, of, of privilege. You see him in like on jet skis, and his dad was a bank president and everything else. All these kids are yearning for a purpose and an emptiness in their life, and I think that's what's driving that. But you're right on that. Um, as far as Saddam, uh, Saddam Hussein, I think you're right. We were pretty close with that guy when we were fighting the, the Russians that had taken over Afghanistan, and we were saddled up pretty good. And I think you bring up some good points. Yeah. Well, you know what? Stay on the line, caller. Yeah, though. caller, um, you, you do. And, and the one I talk about all the time is the issue of fiscal responsibility. Yeah. Um, and I've said publicly that the Republicans lost the majority in Congress when we lost our soul as, as the party of fiscal responsibility. Mm -hmm. When we got to the point where the Republican majority in Congress was spending as much as the Democrats used to, mm -hmm. to the point where the American people saw no meaningful difference mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats, then we lost. We lost our soul as a party. We lost a core part of our identity. So the caller is exactly right, and that's why. That's why um, I've not been afraid to stand up, even if it means disagreeing with my own party. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, your caller, caller, you may not realize, but in, night, in 2007, in my first term in the state Senate, I'm in my second term now, I was the only senator and the only Republican in the General Assembly to vote against the 2007 state budget. Mm -hmm. And I stood up there because I believed in, in my judgment that we shouldn't support it because it violated the state spending cap, and that was there to protect us from overspending, and because I believe that that budget was structurally out of balance and was going to result in massive deficits. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, caller, to your point, and, and people have this frustration, not just the caller, but throughout this district, mm -hmm. you know, people concern less about party than they are with people who are willing to stand up and do what they think is right. Mm -hmm. And to not be afraid to call a spade a spade even if it means disagreeing with your own party. I've done that. And that's the kind of leadership I want to bring to Washington, in part because we need it, and in part because Chris Murphy, with all due respect, has never shown that kind of independence. Mm -hmm. He has been blindly loyal to Nancy Pelosi nearly 99% of the time. Who agrees with someone that often? Yeah. You know? Yeah. A, a, you know and, and we need in this district someone who's not afraid to buck the trend if bucking the trend is what's right for the people we represent. Right. And that's Call what I've tried there? to do. Are still there? Okay, we lost them. But uh, if you're if you're not there, please call back. Uh, I'd like to talk to you. I think you had some uh, some very good points. Yeah. So try and call back uh, 0822. Um, well, that was interesting because, but I think they have a point. Yeah. I mean, if there's no, I, I think it was Ronald Reagan that said because uh, you took a shot at my boy Ronald Reagan. But uh, I think Ronald Reagan said, you know, no, uh, what is it? No soft pastels, but it has to be bold primary colors that make a difference. I mean, uh, there there was definitely a difference between Ronald Reagan and Jimmy Carter. Yeah. There's definitely a difference. He came in and cut taxes. Uh, Carter spent. Uh, caller, you're on the air. I have a question about 
I have a question about immigration. The, we are all ears. We are Ross Perot. We're all ears. Let us have it. What, what's on your mind as far as immigration? Well, it's something that's very important here in Danbury. It's a big issue. But Arizona recently passed a law about immigration. I want to know what Sam thought about that law and what his, what his opinion is about immigration in general. Good question. Good question. Yeah. Thank you very much for the call. I, I think Arizona had every right to pass that law. It was born out of frustration. Part of the frustration is the fact that the federal government isn't doing its job mm -hmm. the way it needs to when it comes to enforcing our immigration laws that are on the books. Mm -hmm. And so so the, the, the short answer to the question is, you know, I, I'm the son of immigrants. It's, it's a cliche, but we're a nation of immigrants. So mm -hmm. the issue isn't immigration. The issue is legal immigration versus illegal immigration. Mm -hmm. I support legal immigration, but I think we ought to be enforcing our laws so that we prevent illegal immigration as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I think that means strengthening our borders. I think that that means not looking the other way when some businesses hire illegals and don't do the due diligence they need to do mm -hmm. in order to make sure that they're hiring folks who are here legally. Mm -hmm. I think it means, you know, making sure that we're enforcing the laws that are on the books. And and so if we just did that, mm -hmm. we would take a huge step forward towards solving this problem. The other thing that's important for us to do is to not create a perverse economic incentive for people to come here illegally. Mm -hmm. One of your callers earlier on alluded to this as it related to health care. Mm -hmm. We saw it in the state legislature when there was legislation proposed to grant in-state tuition assistance to the children of illegal immigrants. Mm. Now, the fact of the matter is, if we create an economic incentive mm -hmm. for people to come to this country and come to the state illegally, shame on us. Because mm -hmm. then we're incentivizing the very conduct we say we don't support. Mm -hmm. And so we have to be careful to not create that perverse economic incentive. Yeah. Something's interesting, as far as this whole immigration issue is concerned, with, with the economic downturn, um, it's anecdotal, but for example, there are, there are a number of Brazilian churches even here in Danbury, and, and I'm familiar with some people that work with, yeah. with these churches. And let's say, I think there was five represented just in the Danbury area, and, and the pastors of all five of those churches had reported that um, literally half their congregations have gone back to Brazil, or they've seen their number drop. Now, maybe their sermons weren't quite up to par, <laughs> but I'd say there's generally a trend there that uh, you know sometimes this immigration issue whereas when the, the economy is overheating there are some benefits I mean you know landowners in, in town people that rent properties uh, restaurants stores and so there's there's an economic impact with this immigration community now I understand precisely the difference between illegal immigrations and legal immigration and sometimes there's a, there's areas where people are in transition they've applied they've reapplied they're Parents have a green card, but they don't. But I, I'm saying, you know, the, the concept of well, let's just throw everyone out because they're really destroying everything isn't isn't always isn't always true. That's me speaking. That that's just me. Uh, caller, you're on the air. Yeah, hey, uh, sir. Uh, thank you for answering my question before about your military service. I'm sorry that you were hurt. Uh, thank you for being very honest about it. Uh, let me throw one more at you. Um, I'm an independent and. and Everybody pretty much knows that the Democrats are real soft on the, you know, on the illegal immigration issue. Uh, I personally, I think it should be a national security issue because, hey, we got to find out who's in this country. Um, not only, you know, for if they're terrorists, but they are bringing in disease because they're not being checked. I think that's, you know, pretty much people know that. Uh, there's one thing, though, I, I do want to make a comment on. I did hear in the last couple of days. That I think some state, I don't know where, but they want to pass a law saying that if a person is in this country illegally, not legally, but illegally, and they have a baby, that baby will no longer be an automatic citizen, which happens today. And uh, thank you again, and uh, have a good one. Let me uh, call her while you're there. I don't know if you're still there, but... Um, uh, you know, it's interesting because they say Democrats are soft on immigration. Correct me if I'm wrong, but 
one of the largest amnesty programs ever instituted by a sitting president was with by Ronald Reagan. By your boy? Yeah, my boy, Ronald Reagan. So I, I, I don't know if you can say, and I disagree with what the caller said about you know their illness or something like that. You know, I do agree that it needs to be a more controlled thing. But I guess, I guess in general, I'm I'm pro immigration. I, I I think you know when you look at some of the dying countries in Europe, um, and this might be the caller calling back. But when I see some of the uh, countries in Europe that have no population growth, um, apart from a vibrant immigration program in the United States, that's what drives our economy. That's what drives our need for housing. That's what, you know, um, just drives all the consumer goods and things like that. So, I don't know, I, I guess I'm just not as down on immigration as some well, people are. But, but I'm not sure, Marty, that um, I, I'm, a lot of people who are frustrated about the immigration issue mm-hmm. Aren't necessarily aren't necessarily yeah, hold the line, hold um, the line. down on immigration per se. I think what they're down on in many cases is the fact that people are breaking the law and not coming here under our rules. Yeah. You know, I, I think Marty, you know, if if there are industry segments where they need workers that they're not able to find, mm-hmm. then let's create visas and other ways for people to come here legally to fill those needs. The, yeah. the issue isn't one of immigration as much as it is, and I think what drives people nuts mm-hmm. is the fact that people are breaking the rules. Yeah. We've got generations of people who came here by following the rules, my parents included. And so the issue is, why are we looking the other way with folks who aren't following the rules? And, and I think that's what drives people crazy. So it's, I don't know that it's about wanting to stop immigration mm-hmm. as much as it is a frustration about the fact that people are thumbing their noses at the system. Okay. Caller, uh, you're on the air. Yes. Yes, hello. Yeah, I called earlier. The one I, was, I took a shot at Reagan. Um, yeah. um, I just want to let people know about immigration. Um, there is a constitutional law that if you're born in this country, you're automatically a citizen. It's in the... I mean, they can't do that, nothing against that. And I, I think the problem with immigration is, you sh- um, what part of the problem is these large companies that hire, like, to work on the field, that hire these illegals, um, and these businesses that hire these illegals, you should make it a way that if you're hiring illegals, you're, not, you're breaking the law and you have to pay a penalty. You have to pay a penalty. Another problem that we have in this country, and I want to make one more point about the economy, is, you know, everybody talks about the economy, but we don't build anything in this country no more. Everything, even your clothes, is made in China or somewhere else. Why don't we get some politicians with some backbone and say, with the exception of food and medicine, if you want to sell your products here, you have to build them. Because for every 50 people you have working on an assembly line, there's another 100 engineers, electricians, uh, et cetera, accountants, supporting that assembly line. And that's the problem. We have become a service industry. And now we're going to get some politicians to say, okay, you want to sell your product in America? You better build it here. Because we are 52% of the world's economy. And I want to make that point. So I'll Thank- stay online. All right. Thanks a lot. No, I really appreciate it. If you want to hold the line, I, I think he's right. We can't have an economy that basically we just sell cheeseburgers to each other and entertain ourselves with films from Hollywood. Is that, is that well, what we've come to? Well, it's, it's, it's something we're moving towards. And if we don't put the right economic policies in place, um, then, then we're going to have a situation where it's not going to be cost effective for companies to continue to produce goods here in the United States. See, there are two ways to tackle this problem. We can take a sort of protectionist stance, which is where I think your caller was going, or we can look at the underlying causes. What is it about American policy? What is it about our economic policies, our regulatory policies that are driving people to producing overseas, that are driving jobs out of this country because it doesn't make economic sense to do it here anymore? And so I want people to do it here. I mean, our country was made great by domestic creation and production and manufacturing. And we're losing our soul as a country when it no longer makes sense and increasingly for these jobs to be moving overseas. But I'd rather tackle it, Marty, at the root cause. What are the root causes? What is it about what we've done 
to the cost of doing business in the United States that's changed the economics in a way that makes it not cost effective to produce and manufacture here. We've got to be competitive in this world economy and we're partially to blame mm -hmm. for this situation that your caller is frustrated about and which I'm frustrated about. Yeah, I think it, it's also somewhat regional because if you look at the old Rust Belt, like let's just take Michigan for example, where most of the cars used to be produced, but you go down south, right. you go into South Carolina, they have a BMW plant there that is just absolutely world class. And Toyota, the same thing. They're producing more Toyotas here than they do overseas. But that's a so. cost of production issue. Right. Well, that's, a cost I mean, that, of that's, all, issue. that's all part I of mean, it. I mean, look at Pratt. I mean, yeah. look, at, look at the movement of jobs out of Connecticut alone. Yeah. yeah. Because companies are looking at the global marketplace, they're looking at the United States, yeah. and they're realizing that if they can produce the widget for less in the South mm -hmm. or in the Midwest, then they need to do that. Yeah. And so that's what I talk about when I say, what do we need to do to be more competitive as an economy? Yeah. Not just in Connecticut, but nationally. Yeah. And one of the reasons I'm running for Congress, Marty, mm -hmm. is because we cannot get our economic house in order in Connecticut unless we put a pro economic growth philosophy in place in Washington because mm -hmm. that's the overlay for everything we're doing here. Yeah. If we don't start putting a pro-growth policy in place in Washington, mm -hmm. it's going to be much harder for us to get ourselves out of the hole that we're in here in Connecticut. Yeah. And that's part of what I want to go down and fight for. Yeah, I, I, you know, I agree. I, I'm, I'm going to vote for you. Um, I, I think uh, I, one thing that you had, and we had a, we had a guy on who, who wrote this book about the global economy. Mm. And I think, I think we do everyone sort of a disservice if we just say a little bit like the caller. Caller, are you still there? Yeah, I'm yeah, Okay, good, good, because I'm just you're, you're touching on what you said. And correct me if I'm wrong, but, but if, if there's this idea that, boy, if we just had some tough politicians and, they, and, and we could say, you can't sell your flat screen TVs here at Best Buy uh, unless you build them here. Um, and then all of a sudden that flat screen TV that's, you know, uh, whatever it is, $700, all, all of a sudden becomes $5,200 because it's being built here. I don't think that that's in the best interest of everyone altogether. And it really is a global economy. Anecdotally, today, um, 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 go ahead. But it's not a fair global economy if you're paying a guy in India or in China $2 a day you know, and you're selling your TV for five hundred dollars. I mean, that's not that's not called globally. That's called slavery. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean. The reason the reason you have to pay Americans more because our cost of living is much more. Our air quality is much more. I mean, I mean, it, 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 you could say it's globally if everybody's getting paid the same way around the world. Yeah, I, I understand, but I'm just telling you, that's that's the free enterprise system. And I was going to say anecdotally today, I'm talking to uh, someone about a, a credit card. I'm getting a credit card, and I'm talking to the lady, and she's asking about this and trying to sell stuff. And at the end of the conversation, I said, just out of curiosity, where are you? Where am I talking to you? And she was calling, she was in a phone bank in Manila in the Philippines. Um, you want to get something done on your credit card, more, more often than not, you're, you're talking to India. Um, there, there aren't borders anymore. Uh, the clothes on your back right now, HBO had this great documentary called The Rag Business or something like that. Fascinating stuff if you watch it. Um, and uh, just talking about the apparel business and how everything now, it's not sewn together down on the Lower East Side of Manhattan anymore that it was maybe 60, 70 years ago. Those jobs are gone and they're staying gone. And we just have to be more creative and we have to, we have to think better in some of these muscle jobs, for better or worse, uh, it can be done a lot cheaper in other areas of the uh, of the planet, and that's that's where those jobs are going. Regardless of what you're pr uh, proposing as protectionism, and if you do that, what happened in the original or in the in the depression back in the 30s, it just exasperated it. So I'm a big believer in open markets and and free markets, and I think it benefits everyone. Although in some cases it's tough, it's a tough pill to swallow. Well, you know, because um, I went through this. My father worked for Coach Leather. Um, they were one of the biggest corporations, of, um, you know, they were big, they were all over this country. Right. And when they shut down all their plants in America, it's not just the factory worker that lost his job, the computer programmer, the accountant. It's a ritual, it, you know, I mean, it's a, it, you know, when, when a, people don't understand that when a company leaves, it's 
not just that production floor. There's a snowball effect that everybody gets affected. Yeah. You see, it brings up a good point. Oh. Well, listen, just real quick on your on your list: uh, air traffic controllers, Star Wars, uh, Republicans spending as much as Democrats, the 9/11 terrorists, 19 out of 20 in Saudi Arabia. You took a shot at my boy Reagan, and then uh, being too close to Saddam Hussein before the Iraq War. Uh, did we uh, change any minds on any of those? Oh, yeah, you did. I mean, I understand. I mean, I just want, I just, regardless of who's in office, I want to thank the, I want to thank, I want to thank your guests for being on the show. I just want politicians to represent the people. Um, what's happened in America, every, it, it, it's run by big corporations and, you know, big interests on both sides, Republicans and Democrats. And I don't feel the, the, the interest of the people is being, like, uh, the interest of the people is being met. You know, everything is run by a big corporation. You know, on both parties, you see who who's financing everybody, and it's like, you know, everything's like a backdoor deal. Like, this corporation, this lobby is, you know, everything, it, 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 it should not be called Congress or whatever, it should be called Fortune 500. That, you know, that's what seems what's running America now. What do, you th- what, what do you think of my guest, Sam Calagari? Do you think he's a straight shooter? Do you think he's a man of the people? I mean, he's coming, comes out to this studio late at night and he's answering your questions. Do you think he'll represent you? Okay, I think so. I'd like to talk to him one day in person. All right, all right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll make that happen and uh, vote for Sam. <laughs> thanks, okay. thanks a lot for calling in. I really appreciate your time. You know, Marty, if I may, right. I, I think your caller represents mm-hmm. the way I think most people feel. Yeah. I mean, I... Uh, they they just desperately want someone who they think is actually going to fight for them. Yeah. They know they're not going to agree with their policymakers all the time, mm-hmm. and that's not what they're looking for. But they want they want someone they really believe is going to do what's right for them. And I'm going to suggest to your caller and to everyone go on my website www.samforcongress.com www.samforcongress.com. Read about me. Mm-hmm. You know, I've stood up. I've stood alone. I've bucked the trends when I felt I needed to. Because for me, it's never been about power. It's never been about holding office. It's always been about trying to do my best Weren't to the, the best of my of ability. Weren't you one time? I, you, yeah, you I took over. the offices to the mayor's, yeah. uh, the keys to the mayor's office? I, I woke up from knee surgery, uh, okay. the mayor of Waterbury, at a time, really, in, in the darkest chapter of that city's history. Uh-huh. Uh, the city had been taken over for fiscal mismanagement mismanagement yeah. just a few months before I became the mayor. We had another mayor who was carted off on alleged corruption charges, mm. and I woke up from knee surgery the mayor uh, mm. of that mess. And one of the most important decisions I made was not to run in my own right, mm. because I thought it was critical that we have someone who was just focused on doing the job. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons I'm a big supporter of term limits, mm-hmm. and I've said that I would term limit myself, yeah. is because I think it's critical that we send to Washington people who don't want to be there for 20 and 30 years because then they get sucked into this careerism they get sucked into a system that's designed to perpetuate their existence as career politicians Mm. you at that moment in time you begin to sell out Mm -hmm. just a little bit maybe and then it grows and then it grows and before you know it in a lot of cases your own getting reelected reelected yeah. becomes the most important thing in your life it's sickening and you can you can see it who is that and people old are guy well in pennsylvania that switch oh or uh, specter yeah i'll inspector yeah what a piece of work that guy is. Well, and then he you know said I mean? he did it because he wanted to win office. Yeah, but he's, you can tell they're clinging. You know, go yeah. go get a real job, you know, for a while. Well, and that's why I've, I've turned away power. I believe in yeah. term limits. And I think that's really important because mm-hmm. we need people who are going to focus on doing the job, Marty. Wasn't it Cincinnati who back in the Roman times, you know, was out plowing the field and the, the nation of Rome needed him and he went He went there. out and then he... To, you know, drain the back. swamp and went back to the plow. Okay, you're going to be a modern-day Cincinnati. We have a caller <laughs> on the phone. Uh, I happen to know this caller, and he's usually very smart and profound. He has a blog called Hat City Blog, which uh, it's been proven has given high blood pressure to our beloved mayor, Mark Bowden, for as long as he's been in office. If you ever go there, scandalous stuff, scandalous. It's a, it's a real rag. HatCityBlog.com. Uh, but caller, are you there? Oh, you call me a paper, right? How dare you? No, no. Look, I, 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 I love this class. Five minutes of a kumbaya moment between two Republicans. I want to get some hardcore questions in here real quick. Um, first of all, Sam, 
I think your caller is struggling with the fact that I actually got the nomination because you asked me exactly that same question when I was back a few months ago. And um, But you know what? The, the reality is ultimately what voters need to decide mm -hmm. is which one of us is in the best position to do what voters want us to do. Mm -hmm. I'm the only guy in this race who has a record that can show that I can do more than just talk the talk. You know, everybody's going to talk about fiscal responsibility, but guess what, caller? I was the guy in the room alone when I had to make the tough decision under a lot of pressure not to support the state budget in 2007. You were the Every lone voter. The lone vote. Now, you know, caller, everybody else can talk about how they're going to stand up to special interests. They're going to stand up to pressure. Guess what? I'm the only guy in this race on both the Democratic side and the Republican side who's ever done it. And that's what distinguishes me, not just from my Republican competition, but it distinguishes me from Chris Murphy. Chris Murphy's never had to cast a tough vote. He has never once had to stand up and say, no, Nancy Pelosi, I disagree. So uh, I look forward to the next time you ask me these questions, caller. All right. Um, our guest this evening has been Sam Caligari. I'm going to hold you to it. You're willing to come back and debate your opponents? I'm ready. And it's Chris Murphy. Chris Murphy. You can run, but you can't hide. Right here, ideas are working beyond. We've had Democrats and Republicans. You get a fair shake. And if you really want to get elected, come on in, and let's have a nice uh, open debate. And uh, you, can, you can't bring uh, the Speaker Pelosi in with you. But our guest again has been Sam Caligari. He's a Republican-nominated candidate for the 5th Congressional District. We're going to have a nice little intramural uh, primary coming up. That'll be settled in August. And then he'll be the candidate to run against the dreaded Chris Murphy. And uh, we wish them all the luck in the world. And thank you so much for Thanks, coming. Thanks, Marty. All it's right, a really pleasure. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, join us next week on Ideas and Working Beyond when I might have my mom on. Won't that be great? You want to beat that? <laughs> yes, I do have a mother. Uh, regardless of what you heard on Hat City Blog, we'll see you next time on Ideas and Working Beyond. Good night.